Well, hello there. My name is John Meyer. I admit that I'm jealous of the Rick Beatos and the Christian Hensons of this world who can, you know, climb up a hill and turn the camera on and talk. And it's great. They make a few edits here and there. I tend to get lost in making these videos and I read each line three or four times and then I spend eight hours on B-roll. I'm not going to do that today. I just want to have a discussion about samples. I'm, I'm somebody that makes samples and tries to sell them to you. If you watch my channel, you know that I've been trying to do that. And I also use samples. I buy samples from other companies to use in my own productions. I try to use as much live instrumentation as possible, but that's not always an option. But today I want to talk about using samples and perhaps some of the potential issues that we run into when we use samples in our projects. So what is a sample? Well, at its most basic form, maybe you buy a keyboard and it's got a piano sample in it or a drum machine and it's got a kick drum and a snare, snare drum and a hi-hat. Simple sounds that require quite a bit of our own input to create something interesting. On the other end of that spectrum are these long held out patterns and long phrases. Software like Splice and Output Arcade, both of which I pay for subscriptions and I continue to do so. I'll talk more about that later in the video. But those, those software packages are full of sounds that are inspiring and creative and modern and cool. And it is so easy to just hold down a key and be done but perhaps that is not the best approach. And let me tell you why. There is nothing wrong with using those sounds. I mean, they are created for you to use. Sample library developers create these phrases so that you will buy them and then use them. When I make sounds and I've got a sample library coming out soon that will have some individual samples, but will also have some phrases. And I want you to buy it and I want you to use it. But also when I sell it to you, I'm going to say, be careful the way you use this. The obvious reason is that we, that we don't want to sound like everybody else. We want to be original for the most part. Now, I know that there are a lot of younger composers coming up who only know how to write in the computer. They can't play anything. And that's perhaps a different video and a different topic to discuss altogether. But for those of us who've been doing it a while, we want to be original. We don't want to copy other people's work. If a sound is popular enough, we don't want to hear somebody else use that same sound. But for the production music composer who does this for a living, it can also have some monetary consequences. The way our music gets tracked can get kind of complicated. So let's focus in on television. Let's say you get your music on a television show. Maybe you get quite a few songs on a television show. Well, the way we get paid currently and for the longest time, is that someone who works on that television program turns in a cue sheet, a manually filled out cue sheet. And that cue sheet goes to the PROs, the performance rights organizations, and they pay you. We're possibly relying on an intern to get all this information right so that we can get paid. However, on the flip side of that, technologies exist that track every single use of our music all over the world day and night, whenever we know exactly when and where and for how long that piece of music was played. So there's some tension between these two systems. Eventually the technology is going to win out. And that is where this whole topic of samples comes into play. Let's say that composer A creates this piece of music and they decide to use a very recognizable sample from Splice or Arcade. And then another composer on the other side of the world decides to use that same piece of music. Well, they might both get through the process of being licensed and no one really cares or notices, but let's say that both of these pieces of music make it to broadcast. They're on shows that run frequently, they run a lot, and you expect a pretty good payout. Well, if the recognition software examines everything that's out there and finds that this song is exactly like this song, well, there's a good chance that song gets flagged it gets put in a folder and no one ever looks at it again because there are so many other pieces of music that need to be dealt with. Perhaps that sample was vital to your track or it was just an extra little sample that you threw in, but the AI recognition software doesn't matter. It thinks they're the same and so nobody gets paid. My previous videos about music licensing and this video included have been me trying to get you to think about where the music ends up and think about that first. Think about the end user and then work your way back. So you have a television show, or perhaps it is a commercial. You have a company that hires an ad agency who gets the music from a music library and back to you. You don't want to do anything that could make it difficult for anyone in this chain. Music libraries don't want clients hearing a piece of music that sounds very similar to the music that they bought 
because someone used the same sample. I don't want the publishers coming back to me and say, John, somebody turned in this piece of music that has an exact same bassoon solo. Earlier in the video, I mentioned that I'm not getting rid of my arcade and splice subscriptions. You might be asking why, and that's a legitimate question. I find those sites and software invaluable when it comes to researching new genres. They do a great job of having artwork and titles and descriptions for these sounds. And it usually involves someone writing a piece of music with a very specific sound. And then they break that down into its individual components that you can download and use in your own music. You have to be super careful. Sometimes I might use a kick drum or a snare or a hi-hat but when it comes to those more involved phrases, that's where you run into trouble unless you really manipulate them. And there are some libraries out there that say don't use them at all. So be very careful. But to have access to these multi-track recordings and to hear how they work, how they work together, then I can go and take that information and use that when I'm creating something new. I'm not going to copy it, but... I hear how the composer took these sounds and made them work together in an interesting way. Well, I can reverse engineer that and start thinking the way that that composer thought. But that's the job, is to get into the brain of people that make music that is moving people out there and figure out ways to make it your own, combine with your own skills and create something interesting. And hopefully you create something that the music libraries get excited about. And when they get excited about it, they share it with their clients and their clients with the brands. A mindset in this business that doesn't work is that you're gonna create one hit song and that's gonna propel your career and pay your bills for the rest of your life. And perhaps that sample is really what you need to make your song awesome. But you're trying to build a body of work. So the best thing to do is even if it's not as good, try to recreate something that works for your track and then move on to the next. A large catalog full of quality music. It's almost like investing in the stock market. You put a little here, you put a little there, you make the best choices with every single song, and then you move on. That's the only way that I know to make it in this business long term. As always, leave comments, ask questions. This is a complicated subject, but it's something that we need to be thinking about. Before I go, go check out QTube. They reached out to let me know they have a Kickstarter going on. They're trying to raise money to create a film that composers like us can score. There's a lot more to it. There's more information on their website. So yeah, go give them a look. Talk soon.